Can you all see that, folks? Yes. yes. Roy, is that the correct lecture? Yes, that's the one. OK, over to you. OK, ready to go? Yeah. OK, so, uh, well, it's good afternoon now. I was going to say good morning, but it's no good afternoon. So we have a little bit of a hiatus there. Um, so welcome. I'm pity that we can't uh, meet. And uh, I've always enjoyed coming up to Nottingham and to meet people from so many different countries. It would uh, it'd sign up for this, these courses. Uh, so the back, background, I've been working again on structure and function of antibodies for a very long time. Uh, the focus, uh, and you also now have had a number of lectures that were either directly on monoclonal antibodies or um, aspects of antibody uh, structure and function. So I put mine in more in the context of uh, looking at the uh, some of the basic structural features of uh, antibody molecules um, and how we can exploit that, particularly, of course, in developing uh, antibody therapeutics. And the, cha the further challenge, the well, first challenge, of course, was to actually generate antibodies that we can use in humans. And then uh, the development of biosimilar molecules, so that individual companies would um, invent, if you will, an antibody molecule. They patent it and nobody else could then produce it um, or sell it anyway. Um, and it was thought they were so complex that um, they would have patent rights more or less for their for a life, lifetime. Um, but there was a, a successful development of biosimilars, and that brings down the price of these other drugs. And more than we knew so much about the structure and also about the, the, the genetic engineering that we could actually, knowing have a very complete knowledge of the structure, we may be able to actually make new antibodies that don't exist exactly in nature, depending upon the disease indication to amplify one biological activity and maybe even suppress another. So that's sort of a digest of where we're going. <clears throat> so the focus is on IgG. This is because um, IgG is the antibody uh, that is predominant in human serum. Um, <clears throat> and and, that, and uh, early on, some techniques for isolating, purifying it uh, were developed. And so the study uh, began. But of course, that's polyclonal IgG. That is IgG, which has antibodies to everything that we've been exposed to, more or less. Um, and it is difficult to uh, properly assign structure and function there. What we really needed was to have monoclonal antibodies of defined structure. And uh, the, we couldn't do that because uh, if you take it, if you immunize a mouse, for instance, and take out the spleen, you can take, you can culture the cells for a while, then they gradually die off and you have to start all over again with another mouse. Uh, so uh, for many years, uh, I was actually working with monoclonal human immunoglobulins, but this was from patients that had cancers of plasma cells. And that is a single plasma cell, which is proliferating, of course, uncontrolled. And this gave me uh, access, and many others, of course, to monoclonal human IgGs. And I that's worked on those structures. The problem there was we never knew what the antigen was, and so we couldn't make antigen antibody complexes. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, we're now very well advanced, I think, uh, in the development of our structural function relationships of human IgG and the exploitation of it for therapeutics. Uh, slide, Steve. So I think it was, we, I've really covered the, 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 the second slide with at the bottom with the aim, the objective of uh, relating it to the development of biosimilars and biobetters. Next slide, please. <clears throat> right. This is just to emphasize two, 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 two points to you. Uh, one at the top here, you see IgG there, it is listed as IgG1234, and these are the subclasses of IgG. As I say, we work on this because it's the predominant antibody present in the blood. 
To the right of that is the, uh, the, the green uh, large antibody IgM, uh, which in fact is the first antibody which is produced to an immune response and is the receptor which is on a B cell, which, which uh, interaction with the antigen leads to its selection and the development of the immune response. Much larger molecule than uh, the IgG, as you see. In fact, it's like five IgG molecules linked together. Actually, where we're most vulnerable to infection is along the respiratory gastrointestinal tract. And so we need to have antibody uh, present there. And that isn't IgG. Uh, that's confined largely to the, to the serum. And there is a different class of antibody, IgA antibodies, that are predominant in the uh, uh, map from the mouth and through the gut, all the way through the gut and, and in the uh, lungs and so forth. And there are two subclasses of IgA. Now, you will, I'm sure, be aware of uh, the fact that uh, uh, it's increasing in our societies of um, individuals with allergies, uh, which can be more than life threatening, that, uh, that can lead to a rapid death. And that's another class of antibody, IgE. And the fifth class is IgD. Now, there are small amounts in, in our blood, um, but they, and they can have antibody function, the recognized antigen, but we don't know of a, a specific response uh, or value of, of the IgD response there. However, IgD is expressed as a membrane receptor on early B cells. And so it's part of the maturation of early B cells through to mature B cells. Slide. So uh, this from the simple four chain structure, which you see on the left hand side, that the antibody is that we have, I'm sure you've met already, that there is the light chain. It has a variable region and a constant region. The heavy chain has a variable region and really three repeating constant regions. Uh, of course, these are large protein molecules, so they have a three-dimensional structure. And then the variable regions interact with each other to give a quaternary structure, as seen on the right-hand picture. And that generates the antigen binding site. Then the constant region of the light chain and uh, the first one of the heavy chain also um, have a quaternary, quaternary structure. Then there is an open, flexible region of the, pro of the molecule, which we refer to as the hinge because that's what it does. And we can cleave that molecule with enzymes in various ways now, and it releases those two top fragments, each of which now can bind to antigen and are referred to as the FAB. That is the fragment antigen binding. And the bottom section, actually, with the, when first uh, this was done with rapid IgG, it crystallized, and so it was known as the fragment crystallizable. And that's the nomenclature we use uh, throughout all the classes with FAB and the FC. A distinguishing feature in the FC, or a distinguishing feature in the FC, is the sort of uh, I don't know, apples, or, apples and pears or um, grapes and so forth that you see in the middle there, which is the carbohydrate. And it is particular here because it is integral to the structure of the molecule. Now, some 50% of our proteins are glycosylated, have carbohydrate on them, but it's always attached at the surface of the molecule, it's freely mobile, interacting with the aqueous phase. So this, when it was discovered, was a unique feature for the IgG uh, molecule. It's being sequestered within the structure of the molecule. Slide. So we have the four subclasses, and they're listed here, as you see, IgG 1, 2, 3, 4. And that is in the, the nomenclature reflects the relative concentration of each one in normal human serum. So you see IgG1 predominates, 60% of the IgG present in your blood is of the IgG1 subclass. 
that was about the same with the multiple myeloma, the, the, the cancer of, of uh, plasma cells. Also, 60% of patients will have IgG1. 25% will the um, cancer, the, the prior protein, will be IgG2. Then you see 10% IgG3 and only 5% IgG4. So very big difference in the, concentra in the relative concentrations. The other numbers uh, by IgG1 um, is the 136, is, the, is when I made the slides anyway, was the number of different monoclonal antibodies of potential therapeutic value that had been generated. Uh, now, we will see that the, the IgG1 has multiple effector functions. Act, modes of action. And sometimes, seeing that well, patients, uh, I mean, these are inflammatory reactions, but uh, directed for a benefit, ultimately. Uh, and sometimes you don't want those inflammatory reactions. And the data that had emerged was that IgG4 was the, the class, subclass, with the least of, of these biologic act activities. And so maybe it was a good idea to use IgG4. I think that was a rather mistaken idea. Um, IgG2 would be a better candidate, and more people now are looking. The, one of the first things, therefore, if you want to generate a, a, a therapeutic uh, an, a IgG antibody, is to decide which subclass. Now, that wasn't the case to begin with. Now, it very much is. So the next slide, therefore, is to look at the, 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 the FAB part we've, we've dealt with that uh, binds to a, a antigen. Excuse me, I'm just going to... Oh, sorry, my other computer is now... gone on me. Right. Um, sorry, excuse me a moment, please. I'm just going to put my other computer on because it shows me the succession of slides, which so this one does not. Okay, I'm back on, I'm back on track. Uh, so the next slide, please. Slide. Okay, so again, just got another uh, view, alternative uh, view of the uh, IgG molecule, and now again, clearly uh, illustrating that the FAB part, that, that part of the molecule is, is all about antigen binding, and the effective functions, the consequences, are the uh, property of the FC. And go to the next slide, please. Next slide. <laughs> what we see is on uh, white, the white cells that are in the blood, the ones that, that, that the macrophages, eosinophils, neutrophils, and so forth, they have receptors on their surface that will bind to the, recognize and bind the FC region of the IgG molecule. And when you form antigen antibody complexes, they bind to these FC receptors, activate the cells, and that is the downstream activities. Now, um, our uh, we have identified that those FC receptor interactions are determined by the structure in close to the local lo the hinge region there, that you see with the, the, the green circle. Another mode of action is um, complement activation. The first component of complement, which is C1Q, and that also binds in that uh, that region. Uh, further down in the uh, what is actually the CH2 CH3 divide, um, there is a, the, the uh, red ellipse. This is another FC receptor, the FCRN, which is known as the neonatal FC receptor. And that is a receptor which is responsible, first of all, to catabolism. It controls the catabolism of the IgG molecule. 
And it's a very long lived molecule by all other protein standards. There's a turnover is about 23 days or so, which is very beneficial for its therapeutic use. And also it's responsible for transport of IgG across the placenta. The newborn human infant is not immunocompetent um, and is protected by IgG, all subclasses that have crossed the placenta and is present, therefore, in the infant's uh, blood. But the turnover, 23 days or so, is going so far that by six months, there is very little antibody present, by which time the, 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 its own immune system should have developed and be functional. If not, then it uh, will be subject to recurrent bacterial infections, um, and that has to be um, uh, has to be treated maybe with uh, intravenous immunoglobulin. I'm not going to go along that road for a moment. Uh, so antibodies are, th are there to protect us against, particularly against bacteria, um, not so much virus because virus gets inside the cell, whereas the bacteria are external to the cell. And staphylococcal protein, uh, staphylococci, streptococci are uh, pot potential um, <coughs> Uh, in fact, evasions. Now, what we actually see, though, is that there has been also evolution of, of these bacteria, and that these bacteria actually themselves produce a protein that binds to the human IgG, and by binding to the FC, it silences these uh, mechanisms of action. We got our own back uh, on this by uh, growing up very large quantities of um, staphylococcal and streptococcal and isolating this protein and we use it for purifying the monoclonal antibody therapeutics. So the, uh, we have tens and 20,000 litre uh, fermenters and then to purify, the first step in purification of the IgG is to pass it through a column which has these bacterial proteins on their surface and then to elute them uh, the IgG from that. So uh, we've been quite smart, I think, there. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? So now I'm listing here these ligands that, that uh, mediate these IgG S series effector functions. We have th uh, three families. As you see there, also you can see from in the brackets that they interact differently, differentially with the uh, and, uh, subclasses. And interactions here are um, responsible for the me means of clearance of phagocytosis, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, generation of superoxide, release of enzymes, immunoregulation, etc. But added to that, not only are there three families, but there is, there is a polymorphism in the human population. So where the asterisks are, are there, they're, they're subject to polymorphisms. So more diversity within the system. And also, as we will see, is dependent on the glycoform of the IgG. And also, we'll see, also the glycoform of the FC receptor itself. <coughs> So again, the mechanisms that are active here are complement activation, two pathways, in fact, the C1Q I've mentioned already, but there is a lectin pathway, and that, that is the a lectin is a protein uh, which interacts with carbohydrates, binds carbohydrates, and certain glycoforms of IgG can, uh, can activate this lectin pathway. Then at the bottom we see the FCRN again, which is responsible for catabolism and placenta transport, um, and that it is uh, that that binds all four subclasses. So that's not the end of the complexity. If we pass to the next slide, <clears throat> you see listing here now the, these FC receptors. The cell types that they are expressed on, um, and the and the consequences, and across to the right hand side the subclasses. So if you look at that those tables, uh, you'll see that almost 
each FC receptor and each different cell type has a, a, can have a unique profile of the specificity of the receptors on their surface. So this is a, a presumably this, this diver, huge diversity is something which is uh, advantageous, obviously. It's developed and been selected for as advantageous uh, to, to us. So we're looking at the subclasses again. And again, as I say, if you're going to make a therapeutic, you could be looking at a, a chart, something like this, and deciding, or trying to understand maybe which is the best um, uh, subclass, uh, depending upon which uh, cell type you want to activate. And I'll leave you at your leisure to digest that. So move to the next slide, please. So this just lists again the um, uh, diff different types of mechanisms which uh, we may uh, try to uh, provoke or suppress, depend again on what disease application there may be. So the, I don't need to um, read them through to you. You can do that very much for yourself. Through to the next slide, please. So a kind of summary here of where if you have a target cell, cancer obviously would be the thing, a target cell or, uh, that has a mo molecule on the surface that we, that we can uh, isolate, attack, uh, to, to attack, to generate a monoclonal antibody against uh, something which identifies that cell, the antibody binds to it, and then that, that the uh, through the FAB part, of course, the FC is exposed. Now this cell is covered in antibody. The FC is exposed. It can bind to the FC receptors, and this may result in uh, just as a sing single blocking. It may um, trans for a signal through to the cell, which results in its death. It can attract in effector cells that recognize the FC, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, complement activation, um, or we can actually also put a toxic on the antibody and target it so that when it gets internalized, it kills the cell. So again, multiple pathways. Um, and so it really is a big exercise to um, determine or to make a decision about what sort of a, uh, antibody you're going to you're, you're going to develop. So just turning now to the the question of uh, the uh, first of all of uh, the glycosylation, it was ignored for decades, um, including myself. Other than just mentioning to students that uh, two to three percent of the mass of the molecule is carbohydrate. Then we and others uh, got early on asking another question about that, uh, which was, well, we, we, can, we get to the point where we can produce antibodies in other, other organisms. And uh, we produce an, uh, what, in, insulin and so forth in E. coli. Uh, well, what about producing part of antibodies in E. coli and things like that? We found that they don't function. No, E. coli does not add carbohydrate. So question was, uh, can we make, uh, next slide please. If we make an antibody which is not glycosylated, what is the, com is the consequences? And here you see the consequences. Now I should emphasize in fact, that this is actually looking at where you have uh, a monomeric IgG and you have a cell it will be a cancer cell line that has the particular FC receptor on it, and you label the, uh, the IgG and look to see if it binds to the FC receptor. Um, and you can do that, um, particularly with FC R1, which is got relatively high level. <coughs> and we then see that if that sort of experiment, that we see that the binding is either hugely reduced or completely abolished. A little bit different when you have antigen antibody complexes, because if you have a target cell which has multiple antibodies bound to it and the target has multiple FC receptors, then you're looking at aggregated forms of the FC binding to uh, multiple FC receptors on cells. And we'll talk more about that in the uh, 
after this afternoon's lecture. Note, however, FCRN binding is unaffected. And that can be turned to good advantage. Uh, <coughs> because um, if we if we we want an antibody, we we want it to retain this long its long half life. If we don't want these inflammatory reaction cas cascade, then maybe we, we could use an agglycosylated antibody. And indeed, they have been produced and uh, 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 are uh, approved as 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 particular drugs. Um, again, microorganisms have uh, also sussed this out and come up with some sort of an answer to it on the next slide. We see again two bacteria species that have, uh, which were mentioned there, that have produced enzymes that actually specifically cleave off the carbohydrate from antibodies. And they're hugely specific. They will take the carbohydrate off an IgG antibody, but not the carbohydrate off of other serum proteins highly specific, and when they knock that off, they have an aglycosylated molecule and the, antibody, and the antibody does not activate the downstream processes, and therefore uh, that's a, a threat to us, of course. So I find that, that sort, those sort of uh, match mutations, evolutions, are really quite uh, well, fascinating. Move to the next slide, please. Uh, so here, I'm just looking at that region that uh, we saw, as you see, the, the molecular form of the neonatal FC receptor, FCRN, that binds at the junction of the CH2 domain, CH3 domain. And that's a fascinating part of the molecule. It's not just that. That's where protein A binds. It's where the streptococcal protein G binds. But it's also where certain viruses bind. And by binding there, they then can get, they can then be ingested. It actually aid, uh, aids their ingestion and uh, uh, infection rather than otherwise. Also, we see that in rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease, that means the immune system is acting against self. And one, uh, one of the components we see there is an autoantibody, rheumatoid factor is referred to. And the rheumatoid factor is in fact an autoantibody directed against the FC, the patient's own IgG FC. So you see other ones listed underneath there. I wish I could get rid of this band across my code. Uh, no, I can't, I can't, can't do it. Um, obscures, mine is a little bit obscured. All right, so move to the next slide then, please. So uh, part of our conclusion here, and again, this is now in drug development and the regulatory authorities. So glycosylation is identified now as a critical quality attribute of a therapeutic antibody. So if uh, we're producing a therapeutic antibody in these very large scale fermentations, we must have 100% of the antibodies must be glycosylated if that's if we want to exploit them. We can't have it being 90% here and tomorrow 70% or somebody else trying to produce the same antibody and it's 50% because it affects the biological activity, so it has to be defined. On the other hand, if we wanted to use an aglycosylated molecule, it must be 0%. Now that's a very, very big demand on industrial productions of the, of the thera antibody therapeutics. And so uh, the regulatory authorities also, you have to submit to them your whole production process and how at every stage of the production process that you have determined what is the optimum way, uh, 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 parameters that yield consistent structures. That's, uh, this is what is referred to as the quality by design parameters, QPD. There are many others all the way through uh, the, the production process. Right, um, so um, I, I think surely you, you have uh, looked through or seen the uh, generation of the monoclonal antibodies, mouse monoclonal antibodies. Uh, 
um, to human proteins. And that was first of all exploited uh, for the development of um, assays, uh, of quant quantitative uh, assays uh, of hu human immunoglobulins. But of course, you couldn't give it to patients because the mouse, human IgG is immunogenic to the mouse, and mouse IgG is immunogenic to the human. <coughs> So the next le level would be whether, uh, whether we could possibly um, reduce the amount of uh, uh, mouse, uh, ideally, of course, to make fully human antibodies. But again, that, that took 10 to 15 years to do that. So let's just look at the next slide and look at the stepwise. Oh, and the next slide, please. So humanization of the mouse IgG. Here, so here's the IgG, which is familiar to us. So it's look at, we're looking here now at just the, the genes for the variable region of the light chain and the variable region of the heavy chain. There are, for the light chain, two major components, some 40 V region genes and six J region genes, separated by a large amount of DNA. And uh, when we're making an antibody, or when the B cell is making an antibody, there's a selection amongst those 40 V genes and J chain, and then they're brought together and joined together. Um, and it's an error prone mechanism, if you like. It's not really error prone, it's designed to introduce more um, diversity at that point. Uh, bottom of my slide is actually somewhat obscured, but uh, there you see for the heavy chain, you have a V, v genes. J genes, but in between there are G, D gene segments, some maybe 30 of them, and they can combine and together. And again, all, all, all the time that that's happening, there's mutations, uh, hypermutation introduced, and that's how the antibody library is produced. Um, but and, and if we look at the heavy chain and look at the constant regions, CH1, CH2, CH3, is again in the DNA, it's the same way. So these are all blocks of DNA, and we know how to chop out blocks of DNA and recombine them together. So this was the opening of, where say, of ways of saying how we can make, take a mouse antibody, take out the DNA, the genes for uh, determine the specificity, that's the VL and the VH genes, and bind it, combine it with the constant region genes from a human. And the next slide, that gives us a, a chimeric antibody. The next slide shows the murine antibody, on, first of all. Actually, three, of, three, three murine antibodies have been used therapeutically. You can only usually use them once in extremists. You can't uh, subject the patient a second time. Then what opened up the whole um, therapeutic field was the generation of the chimeric antibodies, referred to as chimeric because they have two different species, mouse and human, and it's the Greek chimeric uh, uh, creature, lion, goat, and serpent. And that's where the chimeric comes from. So the idea was, look, these FAB fragments, we can make the FAB fragments, they bind to the antigen, they have the specificity, bind it onto the constant region of an IgG, and we then found that we could, could, in most cases, then the chimeric antibodies, you can dose patients and you can redose them. Um, they will go on mostly to make antibodies, uh, to, and you may have to desist at that time. So it's not good enough. So what if we can actually, the red parts of there is the actual antigen binding uh, se sequences, what if we can just take those amino acids out of that binding site and get a human antibody, take its, the, bind the, the, the amino acids at its binding site and substitute the ones that were in the mouse. And that has been achieved. Um, usually you have to go back and put a few mouse uh, residues in again to get good affinity and so forth. That was the humanized antibodies which we refer to as CDR transplants, that's the complementarity determined in region. So the actual binding site has got to be complementary to the antigen. And I've generated a new animal at the bottom, as you see there, the chimeric. 
which is which is can be now is 90% human and uh, maybe 10% mouse still hasn't achieved our main goal fully human that is now achieved one by silencing the immunoglobulin genes of a mouse and transfecting the, their cells with the genes human immunoglobulin genes and uh, you can then immunize the mouse isolate the spleen and the antibodies that you uh, generate are fully human antibodies. Um, so that's the humanized mouse. And the other one is it, it, gene, tra gene transfer. There is another route as well. I won't uh, uh, take up time for that just now. Uh, so uh, you see the numbers here um, of the the open, the open numbers were, at the time of making these slides, was uh, the number that were approved, therapeutic antibodies approved, and the number that were in the pipeline, and now it's in the hundreds, hundreds all over the place. There's obviously is an emphasis on now of uh, generating fully human antibodies. And the next slide. shows again there now the chimeric antibodies, some of those antibodies that have been uh, are, are approved, uh, of course. Then the humanized ones, the Avastin, Simsia, and many others, just a, this is just an example of the those. And then the fully human, Humira was the first one, um, particularly for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and it is the largest selling drug in the world, by value anyway. Um, and uh, actually that one was uh, derived by phage display library, which I won't go into further, but it was got um, Professor uh, Greg Winter Nobel Prize about two years back now for developing the methodology for that. The whole heavy chain, light chain, uh, the structure, four chain structure of the antibody molecule uh, was resulted in a Nobel Prize for Rodney Paul Porter at Oxford University and Jerry Edelman's at the, uh, where was it, in New York. In New York, they showed a Nobel Prize for that. So there's some of the progress of how making the, the antibodies and um, then we have production platforms that we, we may, may need. The next slide uh, shows production platforms that have uh, have been uh, uh, investigated, developed, and indeed now mostly uh, used. I think most of these now have, uh, there are antibodies that have been used therapeutically. You see at the top, the mammalian, and Chinese hamster ovary cells are the ones that predominate. In the first instance, it was thought, these are mouse antibodies, use mouse cells. Um, but unfortunately, the mouse will put, as you'll see later, will put on a sugar which we don't, never put on our proteins, and it's immunogenic, and it makes the product immunogenic in humans. So you've got to get rid of that. And then there's some human cells, and they're not they're not favoured because they can have viral genome, uh, virus uh, DNA in in their genomes, and may not be safe. Transgenic uh, uh, goats and uh, sheep etc and I work with a company in the United States who had produced a, a, a therapeutic in the transgenic goats uh, which is approved um, and, and patients have to use that it's a human protein of course in the goat um, and so again the list here through to uh, bacteria as I said earlier although they don't glycosylate the molecule but in some cases some proteins you might want to use are egg lock in any case. And the next slide, please. Shows here, these are GM chickens, and uh, there are chickens which uh, are producing interferon uh, alpha 2A, and others that are actually producing macrophage colony stimulating factor. And the uh, protein is uh, in the in the eggs, and you, so you just collect the eggs, break them out, and purify the protein. And the next slide, please. Right, so now we're going to turn to the glycosylation, the glycoform of the IgG. Uh, next slide. Right, so just looking along the top here, 
you see part of the, the sequence of the heavy chain in the IgGFC. And there is an asparagine residue at two, uh, is 297. Now, Ig, IgGs are large molecules, 1,400 amino acids uh, pres presence there. So there's only 20 amino acids. So you have 20, 30 of each amino acid. It is only that one asparagine at that one position. I'll go, I'll go back on that in a minute because Steve <laughs> introduced another factor. Uh, but it, it, in the SC region, uh, asparagine 297 is the only one which the carbohydrate is, is actually bound to. And it's, it's a carbohydrate is bound as the molecule is being generated on the ribosome. And what I see on here is the first one is N acetyl glucosamine. Never, uh, that's what that stands for, GLUCNAC. N acetyl glucosamine, the FUC is fucose, man, man is mannose, gal, the model is galactose, and then there's sialic acid, N glycoluminic acid. And uh, the a predominant glycoform which we see in IgG, it's over on the left hand side, referred to as G0. It is one, what is very variable is the presence or absence of that galactose residue. And if you don't have the galactose, you can't have the salic acid. So G0 means there's no galactose. Well, and, and there's no fucose. Oh, G0F is one which has no galactose, but does have fucose. Then we move down one galactose, two galactose, with fucus, without fucus. This means that you could, you could have, if you look down the bottom here, 648 different possible glycoforms. And this is because uh, the heavy chain, of course, there are two heavy chains in our, each IgG molecule, and the, the, the oligosaccharide, the actual structure that's on each heavy chain can be different, not the same, and so you've got all the different co uh, combinations that lead to this very high number. Next slide, please. I won't dwell too much on this, but the linkage between the sugars are also totally specific. Um, well, I should come to that again, but just just bear just bear bear that in mind. And move to the next slide, please. Um, now this shows some st a study which we did. Where we used enzymes, we had a molecule, we determined the, uh, the sugar content, which is over on the right hand side. It had fully galactosylated and fucosylated. We then took a galactosidase and chopped off the galactose. We then took a glucosidase and uh, chopped off the N acetyl glucosamine, um, then chopped off the mannose. And so we have these four different uh, glycoforms of the IgG. The structure in the middle is the X-ray crystallographic structure and shows that there is a change in the conformation of the CH2 domain as we limit the size of the carbohydrate. Beneath that shows these are thermal uh, pictures of the IgGFC, where blue is a very stable structure. Green is a little bit mobility and the, re the red is, is it's a high, it's, it's a high mobile region of the molecule, and again, what we see there as we decrease the oligosaccharide, so the uh, mobility, the uh, lack of conformation, cha changes in conformation, and, and we know, of course, if we take all the carbohydrate off, then we lose biologic activity. So it is absolutely essential to the conformation of the IgGFC and it's uh, bind, li binding to ligands. Uh, yeah. uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so at the top of here is a chromatogram of the, of the uh, oligosaccharides that are released from polyclonal serum IgG. And therefore it shows this uh, complexity. Uh, Heterogeneity, um, because of course this is serum IgG, so it's all of them. Now, if we well, we don't know whether individual molecules in the serum IgG, 
we don't know whether the, the, the carbohydrate is going to be there. But if we take the therapeutic antibody, we look at the bottom here, rituxan, and see the, the carbohydrate content of that, you see that it is very restricted. And it's predominantly this G0F. Uh, uh, and move to the next slide, please. Now, this is one of the first monoclonal antibodies that were approved for therapeutic use, rituxan. And we have the, the, uh, the graph here. Uh, it was rituxan went back and they went and made it without any galactose or with 100% galactose. As I say, you can, do, you can do this using enzymes. And that has made a twofold difference in its ability to activate uh, enhance uh, complement-dependent cytotoxicity for two antibodies, rituxan and campas. Not for all antibodies, but these two, definitely the presence of galactose increased the thing. So the rituxan had already been approved by, uh, by the FDA when these data became available. So FDA goes back and say, right, the material which we, which we approved had about 25% of galactosylation. Therefore, you must maintain it at 25% forever. It must not vary a little bit of latitude, of course. So, because remember, it's a critical quality attribute and you have to be able to define it by quality by, by, quality by design parameters. Next slide, please. Now, this actually shows, I've said about murine cells, okay, that uh, they are not good uh, for producing antibodies for therapeutics. This is because they have an enzyme which adds another galactose in a, in a different linkage. I said linkage is important. Now, the galactose in human IgG is a 1,4 linkage. This is a 1,3 linkage. We do not have an enzyme. None of our proteins have, have a 1,3 linkage ga galactose. And just the presence of that galactose is sufficient that to be immunogenic in humans. And Erbitux, Cetuximab, the one shown here, what we refer to as a G4F antibody, um, has GAL alpha 1 3 GAL. Um, and uh, there has been, well, there has been deaths through this, because, but it was not appreciated early on because some patients not only made IgG antibodies to it, but made IgE antibodies to it as well, and therefore had an anaphylactic reactions. So again, show just how amazingly uh, uh, important, significant is this, not just the sugar, but also the actual linkage. And the next slide, please. Right, shows now how we can we, we, we can start to choose, maybe if you like. We're making a therapeutic antibody. We've chosen the subclass. Now can we choose the glycoform? And we could do can do that in small quantities anyway by using enzymes in uh, in, in in vitro. So few cups. Now that was found that with uh, certainly ninety odd percent of Serum IgG is fucosylated, so fucose, fucose is always present. Then someone produced some which did not have fucose, and it was found to be could be as much as a hundredfold enhance of ADCC. That's killing of cancer cells. So uh, we would like to actually, obviously, um, be able to produce it with, without uh, antibodies without fucose. Um, and the way of doing that again was by uh, CHO cells and knocking out the enzyme which is present in CHO cells for adding fucose. And so a methodology available here that you can now also, you can make uh, that way. Another group found that something else, they were doing a different kind of work and they were looking, you see on the, the bottom one on the left hand side, G naught F, but then on the right hand side, a minor component of normal human serum is one which has an extra NSR glucosamine, the one right in the middle there. Right, yes, Steve's doing a good job here. And 
they found that when they had those molecules, they, they were, you didn't get fucosylation. So it's changing the conformation in some way, and the, the fucosyl transferase that puts it on is no longer able to do so. So this is another way. Both these, of course, are companies that, uh, that did this, have patents on it, and so they, these are advantageous. These are ways of producing a fucosylated, improving the, uh, the therapeutic, giving you more options anyway for, for the therapeutic. <clears throat> and the next slide, please. So this now has, shows an uh, X-ray crystal graphic uh, structure for FC receptor 3, 3A, in fact, actually in complex, as you see, with the IgG FC. Intimate contact down in that lower hinge region that I, we showed you, uh, I showed you earlier. And now we see that the FC receptor, you see it's labeled N162, that is an asparagine 162 of the receptor. And uh, uh, that is found to be essential. If you, no if you knock that out, uh, then it, it, you reduce the activity of the uh, IgG in activating the FC receptor. The FC receptor, as you're now seeing here, I'll show you, has got these three, sorry, five dots. It has five oligosaccharide uh, units bound to it. So the, so the glycoform of the receptor actually becomes important as well. And if we move to the next slide, which is just a magnification of this one, we can see now how this uh, N162 is right in the binding site. Um, and so, yes, this, this is, I, I, won't, I won't go back, but the, the few, the, the fucus residue is that we, we blocks an interaction of the, the carbohydrate there with the carbohydrate and the, and the protein structure of the IgG molecule. So it's absolutely essential. Another feature just to show you here, all these FC receptors also depend on the binding on the left-hand side here, what's referred to as a protein sandwich. There's a protein in the antibody molecule and it's made by two tryptophanes in the receptor. And all the receptors FC receptors, they have those two tryptophanes, and this is one of the binding sites. The other uh, heavy chain, the blue one, has reacts also, of course, with the, with that receptor, but at, it's a different structure, it's a different site there. So we've got two different interaction sites that have to be achieved. Next slide, please. Right, this just again highlights the fact the red is the fucose, as you see, um, and then on the uh, right hand side shows the uh, carbohydrate at residue 162, how it uh, interacts with the carbohydrate and the protein structure of the IgGSC. And just taking out that little five chain sugar, that fucose, prevents that, that interaction and reduces the. Uh, uh, in, the, in the interaction. The next slide, please. Just highlights it again here. The red on the left hand side, the fucose is in place, and now you see the, the uh, oligosaccharide, uh, the sugars of the receptor are not able to bind. And then on the right hand side, take the fucose away and, and it binds. So that should be pretty clear. Uh, next slide. This is a, a theoretical model. Again, show here the, the IgG, the, how the IgG, the hinge region, it's functional because it dislocates. It has to. The FC receptor itself is a, quite a large molecule. And here, the brown are the, are the carbohydrates that are on it. So that has to be accommodated in the structure of the IgG. And so this is where the hinge region really works. It moves out of, the, out of the way to expose the binding site for the FC receptor. And the next slide shows now how, uh, again, the receptor here <coughs> and the IgG as well, that when you're doing the research, has had talking of decades of work here, is if you're producing the recombinant FC receptor, it depends upon the results you get, depend upon which 
cell line you produce it in because the bottom one is the CHO cells. But if you use the human embryonic kidney cells, they put an extra few codes on uh, here uh, on the n acetyl glucosamine. No, on no uh, on on the um, on the galactose on the on the galactose. So uh, and that will give different different um, different re results again. Uh, <clears throat> right, next slide, please. So, uh, summary, both heavy chains are involved in the formation of an asymmetric binding site. The affinity of binding is dependent on the glycophon profile of the FC, and the affinity of binding is dependent on the glycophon profile of the FC receptor. This is all mean for FC receptor 3, which is a predominant uh, mode of action of killing uh, of cancer cells. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're looking at terminal sialic acid. So here we again, we have to have the galactose on the left hand side, and then um, we, we can make sure that we have it fully galactosylated by using galactosyl transferase and then using sialyl uh, transferase, put sialic acid on. Underneath that, you see a profile for uh, serum IgG. No, for a monoclonal antibody which we had been generating. And you see where the, at the end of the sialylated glycans, they're very low levels, obviously a minor, minor population. But if we go through on the next slide, next slide shows that again, what we do, what we do is to ge generate the fully galactosylated uh, protein. It has to be the human type of galactose of uh, sialic acid, which is shown uh, on the left hand side and not the one on the right hand side, which is the one that the mouse puts on, which again is immunogenic in the human life. Uh, so you have to have the, the right sialic acid. And the next slide. It just shows uh, a, further, a further finesse, if you, if you will, that we looked at uh, the amino acid side chains that are the, which the carbohydrate binds to the CH2 domain with. And we changed each one of these then from the one that was present, arginine, vagaline, etc., to alanine, and look to see what impact that had on the bi biological activity. And that, that, that of course, is in the, uh, in the literature. And the next slide. shows the consequences for just doing this to the phenol, uh, sorry, the phenol alanine at residue 243, changing it to alanine. Now that is on the right hand side shows the phenol alanine, which is like al is an alanine residue with a phenol, phenol group attached. All we've done is to take off that phenol group. Everything else is the same, but look underneath and see, make the contrast in the amount of silylation uh, that, that re results uh, from that. So another way in which, uh, again, we can see the multiplicity of, of different antibody form, like a forms that may be formed. Um, and actually now how we can get to, from our knowledge, we can begin to exploit that. Right, uh, so now we maybe have you know, uh, enough knowledge uh, so that we can, uh, one company makes a, an antibody which is um, approved, so another company tries to make exactly the same. Uh, there are such complex molecules that that really is a, it's a very hard task. And we thought initially it would be impossible and that uh, the founder company would have an everlasting patent. But the size of the markets uh, are so big that people went looking for to try and make copies and the regulatory authorities uh, tried to help them to do that. Next slide, please. And the next slide again. Oh, um, 
I've short changed myself a little bit here. Let's move on from that one. We've looked at that one. Um, so what we're looking at he here, again, something of trying to understand function, is what do all these small changes you make do? And the only thing that we could see is just these small changes, like a relaxation of the structure of the molecule. It doesn't all fall apart. Um, and here is superimposed, as you see here, is the, the the red structure is the just the free IgG FC, and the uh, the blue structure is in a complex of when it is actually bound to the FCR3. And there's just this little bit. There's an opening. It would seem we see it as an opening, a relaxation of the structure. And the next slide, we get very bound up in this and start measuring distances across just what is the degree of opening and shutting and closing there. It's not satisfactory. It's the only thing that we can really um, see. Unless you move on to other ways of looking at it. The next slide. This is, this is now nuclear magnetic resonance, which is a, a very demanding uh, technique. And again, showing on the... Uh, a galactosylated is on the on the left hand side, as you see. So that's a nice, easy one to start with, and then a deglycosylated FC, and it just picks out amino acid, which amino acid residues are slightly perturbed, and I mean slightly. There's just to see a small change. Um, again, no, it's not a satisfactory explanation. The next slide. Is well. These interactions are very subtle, and surely the carbohydrate may, may not be intact, uh, irreversibly, it's not irreversibly bound, it is by the covalent linkage at the sparagine 297, but otherwise some of the other sugars may be binding, relaxing, binding, relaxing. Um, and we have to look at it maybe as a dynamic mo uh, molecule, and in vivo, the local environment may disturb that um, equilibrium in one direction or another, a direction which favours the uh, binding and uh, function. And the next slide. Uh, all of that uh, I've led it up to, uh, so saying that we maybe at least understand something of it, we, do, we can discern uh, changes that uh, may explain these changes in the biologic activity. And then this paper can, comes out in which, because depending upon the conditions in which they crystallize the FC, no ligand involved, so the crystal form results in actually two different forms of, the, of crystal structure, one of which is more open than the other. So that's a, the, cha the, cha the challenge remains. Right, next slide, please. Sorry, yes, next, next slide again. So at the time of making the earlier slide, there is, was, um, there's, we we're facing the patent cliff. I mean, again, these are enormously expensive uh, drugs, enormous uh, advantage to the patient, to the, to, to the, the companies that are producing them. Um, and uh, they thought that they had a patent for life. Then the biosimilars came, came along and uh, gradually being introduced and, so, and they, they were dependent upon those incomes. And so there was this patent cliff was, was, was seen. Well, they've met it. The, the, the biosimilars are there in the clinic, um, one after another. They're still, cut, they're still coming out. And, uh, so many in the pipeline. Uh, and new molecules coming through. Uh, uh, now this this patent cliff and the data which is on here, see the companies on the left hand side which were benefiting from the individual ones. Um, <clears throat> and these were the patent cliff were as determined in the United States. Um, but if we take the European uh, regulatory authority, there's differences uh, between between them. Uh, and the next slide shows those differences. So the differences which shows the patent expiry date for biologics. 
In the United States, they tend to give them very much longer times and they go back just when they're getting to the expiry date, the company goes back and uh, appeals to, to have it extended for one reason or another. Um, they, of course, uh, immediately somebody comes up with a biosimilar. They uh, go to court to accuse them of patent infringement and it becomes a very big legal affair. So I'll leave you to uh, conjure, conjure that in your own thoughts, if you will. Uh, next slide, please. So at the time of, again of making this slide, this was, the as you see, the number of therapies approved or in development. And the ones in blue are all antibodies. And so you see what a competitive market it is because the rewards uh, are, well, uh, just, let's not say it's not just in money value, as you see at the moment it's going on uh, cur currently, with, particularly with the COVID, the number of the pharmaceutical society has launched huge amounts of money to make a vaccine. And also, of course, they've developed antibodies and antibodies have been used in, in, in therapy uh, as well. We'll talk more about that this afternoon. Uh, and the next slide uh, shows again, as of this is an updated one, July uh, 2019, of the split between um, the biosimilars, total pipeline, and the, re the reference um, molecules are there. So it's developing all the time. And uh, <clears throat> it's just, uh, I was involved with the uh, acceptance of one of the, the first um, um, biosimilar, in fact. Uh, the next slide, please. Which was a uh, Remsema. It was Remicade was the one that came from the, um, uh, the, 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 the company that, f that first produced Infliximab. It's either you know, called Infliximab or Remicade. Now, if you make a biosimilar, it still has to be named Re Infliximab. Otherwise, it's not the same. But for market, the marketing purposes, well, the, the, the name on the drug is actually has to be different from the Remicade to distinguish which, which company product it is, and that is Remsema. And there was some objection to its acceptance, this was in the European Medicines Agency, because there was a small difference in the amount of FUCOs present in the, between the um, innovator company and the proposed biosimilar. However, it was approved uh, because it seemed that the mechanism of action here was for infliximab was merely blocking. It just binds the, the, the TNF, tumor necrosis factor. It just binds it, and that is sufficient to prevent to uh, alleviate the uh, inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis. And so, for they, at that time, they let it go forward. There's pressure to let it go forward uh, to begin the era of being able to generate and have licensed biosimilar molecules. So um, the next slide, please. Uh, again, showing sort of things of where we are. The antibody to CD20, this was the uh, Herceptin, the first an uh, antibody for, uh, sorry, not, not Herceptin, uh, Rituxan, um, that was for leukemias. And the, of course, the, CD, the target is the CD20 antigen, and that's a large molecule. So it, each company can make an antibody. It's against a different part of that molecule. So the epitope specificity is different. And so it's a different antibody. So the first one here on the top left-hand side um, is this AME, which is now a, lo a long new name. It's an approved antibody. It's a, it's a distinct epitope from Rituxan. And it also, there's a little red star in the hinge region there, which shows it actually has been genetically engineered. So it's one of the amino acids has been changed in the hinge region to increase the ADCC, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Um, it's, it's now being more widely used, but was first approved as an orphan drug. That is that it was beneficial um, for a small group of uh, leukemic patients that 
it, it would so small it wouldn't be profitable to the company to produce it uh, because the market was very small but they get special dispensation if you do that um and then going down the the, the, the next one uh, um offer to mumab that is an a few causalated antibody Obilatuzumab on the other side is, is one which gained it, uh, you know, an A for a few causalated antibody. Above that, Ocrelizumab is, is interesting, I think, here again showing how uh, important it's, it's the specificity of the antibody is. This is an anti CD20 antibody which was being developed again for rheumatoid arthritis and the, it got through to the phase three trials. And then they are stopped and they had to be stopped because there were patient deaths. They were dying of overwhelming infection. It was also being trialed for multiple sclerosis. And in multiple sclerosis, it was being effective and there were no incidents of death. And so it has been approved and is the best antibody currently available, used and available for multiple sclerosis. So the epitome specificity can distinguish between uh, results in it being effective in one disease and uh, well, probably lethal, unacceptable in another. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> We're looking at the FC binding to the FC receptor here. So, of course, the two different sites on the, on the IgG FC on the left hand side and the right hand side. Now it's found that uh, to optimize the uh, FC, you could do it by changing the amino acid sequence um, to the CH2 domain on, the, let's say, the left-hand side. But you would, of course, also do it to the one on the right-hand side as well. Whereas another study would, would did, did the reverse. What we, quit, the short term is, we would actually like to be able to change uh, the sequence on one of the, C the FC, the CH2 domains, and put a different sequence on the other side. So you make two different antibodies, and then you try and separate the, the, them, the, two, the two CH2 domains, and then try and join them back together again in such a way, in a particular way, so that the op ones opposite, a green one matches with the blue one. And that, that, so that's a, a, la a later trick which is being done and uh, to optimize uh, and the structure. And next slide, just finishing off here. Again, just to remind you of the different other isotypes that are there. And the next slide extends the challenge because again, if we looked at all what we've done for IgGs and the subclasses, then look at the uh, here on here is the the oligosaccharides attached to the molecule. So there's only one in IgG, but if you look, uh, their IgE was one, two, three, four, five different sites of oligosaccharide. Now just think of the complexity and the heterogeneity that can be done there. Uh, move down to IgM, you have five subunits there, and four, five again, oligosaccharide linked units to the right, IgA, uh, which has uh, two, or IgA, the other subclass has uh, four uh, end linked. These are all through the asparagine, but actually IgA1 has a, a, a carbohydrate added actually through uh, um, serine and threonine present in the hinge region of the IgA. So, uh, they are um, coming through. In fact, IgM, there's an antibody uh, just coming through now. A company um, is, is, is uh, going for uh, approval of an IgM antibody for a particular application. And IgA antibodies, there's several of them in the pipeline. The next slide just again emphasizes here again the sort of complexity a little bit more about how an IgA, the secretory IgA, which is present in the respiratory gastrointestinal tract, is a dimer and has a, a J, this J chain, joining chain in it. Um, you can explore explore that at your leisure. And the final final slide, oh no, it's not the final, it's penultimate slide, the next slide. 
you see the challenge of IG, uh, IgM, it doesn't only have five of these subunits, but it also has that J chain. And it has another component, which is secretory component, uh, which is uh, right in, in the middle of the molecule. So the IgM and J chain is secreted from a plasma cell. It, there is another cell type lining the, the gut and so forth, which has a component on the surface that the IgM binds to, and it gets internalized into the cell, transported across the cell and released on the, in, into the respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract. But it, it, it does so by get, chopping part of that uh, protein off. And that's a new protein, a new complex, which, which is there. And the final slide, I think there's a final slide. So. Oh, yeah, there's one other thing which to uh, add to it, I don't know whether this strikes home to you, but um, Muhammad Ali, the world boxer weight champion, who used to say he floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee. And I apply that here with making a conjugate here, the, this antibody is again, it's an anti-CD20 antibody, and there's a drug that she's put onto it. Now the, or the toxin actually, the antibody uh, is not toxic when you deliver it to the patient. It's again, anti-CD20, and once it's taken into the CD20 cell, there is an enzyme, enzyme in that cell which will cleave off the toxin. And when it's cleaved in the free form, it is a toxin, it kills the cell. Next slide. Here's a selection of uh, publications that you can visit at your leisure. So, end of story. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Everyone's got the mute on, so they're, 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 they're probably applauding, but you can't hear because yeah. of being so like having muted. Uh, thanks. Did everyone guess all that, hear all that? Looks like it. Okay. Well, Roy, do you have a new recording to offer them, won't you? We have a new recording now. Uh, now the issue is, do we take questions now or do you want to break? Let the students decide. <laughs> I'd quite like to have a quick break, if that's OK. Strike with, uh, strike with the iron's hot, I would think. Yeah, I, th I think. Take a couple uh, of questions anyway. Yeah. Two, two questions now, they, folks, and then another thing will break. They, okay. they can ask some more this afternoon if they want. Yeah. Has anyone got a quick question now they want to ask uh, Roy uh, before we we break? OK, they said there's quite a lot to take in <laughs> with all that. Um, sorry. Um, um, hello, I have a question. OK. Yeah, um, there was a slide showing um, the difference between um, uh, patents, the, how long they last for. So why some um, products are allowed to be um, under patent for 40 years and some for 10 years? Like who decides for how long um, the patent lasts? Uh, the patent authority. <laughs> oh. So uh, you know you have to apply for a patent, and a huge amounts of uh, data that you have to put in. So there can be an initial um, patent. Um, when it, when it, as you see the, the the benefits of this are, are high. So uh, when you get a patent on a biological particular, I think I suppose it's the same for all um, drugs and all patents really. The the founder company will actually during the lifetime of that patent they'll be trying to improve their product and they'll do, as they improve their product they'll go get another patent for that as well and well as their their you know their their um, competitors will actually be trying to make their own uh, one so they can actually often go back and and 
get an extension of the patent, particularly in the United States. And that is why where the expiry dates, we see the differences between the United States and, um, and Europe. And this has been the case with Humira, which is um, the largest, as I say, the largest selling drug. Now the biosim biosimilar Humira is, is uh, available, being widely used in Europe. Here yeah, now, saving the NHS lots of, a lot of our money. In the, in the United States, it's been fought and fought again, and uh, they got the patent ex extended. They finally gave in, but when they gave in, it was only that, right, a biosimilar can be uh, approved, but not commercially available until 2023. So it's it's a it's a huge. Um, I was going to say game, but um, the, there's a big a fight for for. I, mean, I shouldn't say too much, I suppose, about it because I do act as a consultant to these companies when, um, or to legal uh, for companies that are defending or attacking uh, these uh, different patent issues. I mean, with Humira, I think with uh, I think it was with with Humira. All the way through the production process, every time that they they get a quality by design established, then they'll make a patent on that. So mm. that uh, there isn't uh, there's a single patent for the approval, but that is backed up by I think for Hiomira is over a hundred other patents for different stages in the production, purification, testing, and all the rest of the, of the, the thing. So it takes. It usually takes, you know, to get a, the products um, approved, takes 10 to 12 years and costs over, over a billion dollars, you say. So that is why at the onset of COVID, the mm -hmm. idea that one could generate um, a vaccine, I mean, vaccines are the same, the amount of testing you have to do for a vaccine. Uh, populations. The idea that you could do it in 12 months is totally unacceptable. You couldn't possibly get it accepted. But um, the emergency has uh, come up with the opposite. They did, and a similar story was uh, in the 1940s with uh, with penicillin, actually, in terms of uh, breaking those uh, the barriers, which uh, uh, the, the illegal barriers there to protect companies. Uh, they, they, you know, I mean, the companies do a good job, and so they're not all about profits and things. And we've seen that with the the, the, the COVID. The other thing is that because the patent attorneys have a big role to play here in all this stuff, and you'd be surprised to know that a lot of these attorneys are scientifically trained. So yes, they, yes. they come out with science degrees. They know that antibodies. They know their science, they know their molecular weights, all this sort of stuff, and then they uh, they get uh, the uh, the legal qualifications. So these guys are pretty sharp. Yeah, I've had that. I remember a few years ago that um, some of my biochemistry colleagues were in despair. They have these students. They have some very good students that uh, I get a first class degree in biochemical biochemistry. They say. Offer them a PhD, say so you know, they're going to go off and get a legal. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Join a, le jo join a legal uh, company. Absolutely. And uh, both Roy and I have been involved with patent hearings and things. And uh, I mean, you've been doing it a bit longer than me, Roy, a little bit. But uh, my first, I was just amazed at the scientific knowledge of the, uh, the, the attorneys. And that's when I found out that they were actually trained scientists. Uh, very impressive. It's a you know it's a, it's a good career path. Yeah. <laughs> it's not all about making money. It's very interesting uh, as as well in terms of the cases that they 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 deal with. Roy, should we give them a break, Roy? Yep. Okay. So um, we can.